First World War echoes down the generations. Almost drowned out by the Second World War, the First's entrenchment, its senselessness, its tragic waste still has an effect on families, including mine. My mother's grandfather, Hesketh Pritchard, was a big game hunter, a journalist, a cricketer, an Edwardian superstar who blagged his way into the army with one aim in mind, to use his stalking skills in order to teach sniping. Well, this is a lot like uh, the BBC programme, Who Do You Think You Are? I've come to one of Britain's Imperial War Museums to find out more about Great Grandfather. Hesketh Pritchard went to the trenches first in 1915, escorting journalists. He took with him a number of sporting rifles. Brigades and battalions were soon applying to borrow them. If you were a soldier who was a good shot, you got extra pay and privileges, and uh, if you were a bad one, you could uh, look to get all the worst jobs in your company. So uh, there, was a, there was a value to sell marksmanship, but individual marksmanship was not really uh, something that was to the fore. Uh, Germans on the contrary, had a lot of soldiers who were uh, experienced at uh, hunting deer and boar and so on. So there were people experienced in that. And also Germany had a, a really good optics industry. Most of the optics in the world came from Germany. Pritchard started teaching sniping in October 1915 for the First Army and later for the Third Army. He soon set up the First Army Sniping School. Now you're holding his rifle, which I recognise because it used to be in a bedroom cupboard in uh, where I grew up. Why is it specifically a, a sniper rifle? Well, this one's slightly unusual in that obviously at the beginning of the war they adapted the rifles they had. Um, some hunting rifles went front, Germans did the same, but really uh, they, they soon found that the best way to do it was to, to find a, a normal service rifle that was proven accuracy and add uh, optical sights to it. And there's a lot of, uh, of talk about how he, he drew on the, particularly the Scottish regiments, which, which had uh, deer stalkers in their ranks, um, for, well, he says in his book, actually, mainly for the scouting rather than the, 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 the shooting. Yes, I think it's the field craft, yeah, that they knew how to make themselves invisible in a landscape. And as you can see behind me, the uh, sniper robe, uh, other people were at work, artists in many cases, who could assist in, in, in achieving that. And uh, this, this, this is so to enable to man to lie out in no man's land unseen. And if they weren't lying out somewhere between the lines, they would be somewhere in, the, in a sniper post in the cut into the, into the front of the trench. And uh, they would be looking out of the trench, you know, some hole in the trench parapet, which was carefully disguised using rubbish quite often. I've heard elderly relations say that seeing your victim through good quality sights, that murdering them really, contributed to Pritchard's early death in 1922. The doctors said it was an illness. I asked Paul what was the effect of sniping on those First World War snipers? Obviously the First World War is littered with incidents of people uh, in hot blood, killing people who were trying to surrender and so on. You know, it wasn't a very nice, pleasant war, you know, there wasn't much chivalry about it. The sniper is, you know, has to think about it uh, a lot. So how have the role and the equipment changed over the last 100 years? Well, training has increased from five days to nine weeks and clearly the kit has moved on, but not necessarily the mindset of the soldier. Sniping tends to find you, you don't find sniping. It attracts personalities who like to work on their own and they tend to go into that line of trade because of the person they are rather than any kind of benefits. There is definitely a benefit in not moving around. You don't want to move around in a group that makes more noise than two skeletons making love on a wriggly tin roof using a Coke can for a condom because they attract enemy fire. Putting aside tin can condoms, Andrew talks us through the modern day sniper rifle. His primary weapon has changed considerably. The First World War weapon was made out of wood and steel and was at the mercy of, of the elements. A modern sniper rifle is built out of stainless steel, synthetic stock materials or chassis materials like this, which are relatively impervious to hot, cold, wet and dry. This is a Barrett 98B, which is a modern modular rifle. First World War rifle, possibly two inches of, of accuracy at 100 yards. We would expect a rifle like this to stack bullets onto your thumbnail at 100 metres all day long, and, and typically they do. 
The optics from the First World War were may be capable uh, at five power, and that's a very powerful First World War site, capable facial recognition at maybe 400 yards. Um, this is a modern five to 20 power optic, and this would give you facial recognition out to and beyond a kilometre. Uh, in the First World War, a sniper would very often have worked on his own. Uh, modern snipers very seldomly, if ever, work on their own. So you have two suites of equipment with each sniper. He'll have a primary weapon like this. He may well have a secondary weapon like an assault rifle with him. He's probably got a self-loading pistol. And uh, the number two will also have an assault rifle, more typically in 7.62. And that rifle on its own is capable of engaging targets out to between 800 and 1,000 metres. A modern sniper is more of a unit with an 80-pound Bergen rammed full of kit compared to the soldier out in no man's land with a bag full of luck. Well, the next stage of the story takes me to Flanders for a drive past the towns that make up much of the Western Front. The trenches moved agonisingly slowly towards Germany, but sniping moved on in leaps. Great-grandfather says in his book, Sniping in France, written after the war, that the Germans started with the mastery, then the British Expeditionary Force set about killing off the more dangerous German snipers and training its own men, at which, he says, the Germans went to ground, and so his snipers learned to become scouts. To achieve all that, he needed somewhere to set up his school of sniping. Well, Pritchard and his 2IC Grey took a car and drove speculatively around the Pas de Calais region, looking for somewhere to site their sniping school, rather as I've taken a car and driven retrospectively around the battlefields of northern France. They came to this village, Lingham. Up there were rifle butts on a big plateau. They went to have a look. Memories of the wars that have ravaged this landscape are all around. A few minutes outside Lingham, I come across an overgrown farm track that leads up to the old range. This is a bit like Jack and Ori. Grey and Pritchard came up here. Grey says, why? The place is trying hard to be like Scotland, because in those days it was covered in gorse and heather. It's changed a bit since then. I'm dying to see what it looks like now. I suppose I thought it would look like the pictures in Pritchard's book, an 800-yard open rifle range. It's not exactly what I expected. There's a lot more trees than the, uh, the picture, but there's lots to explore. Well, I found this, which is helpful. So it says, after 1944, the woods grew up. And the place is now used for shooting and for, for walkers. Not at the same time, I guess. We actually, we disturbed a little roebuck on the way up here. During the war, 1943 to 1944, it was used as a site to launch the V1 rockets, which explains the blockhouse over there. Quite a lot of history has happened here since great-grandfather was here. Before 1943, it was used for artillery practice. And I have the bit here, what it was like 1916 to 1918. Here's an extract from his book. Beginning with a class of a dozen to 15 officers who were dealt with by two officer instructors, our classes grew until we had 25 officers and 40 or 50 NCOs at each course. But the actual teaching was only one side of the work of the school, for it was soon thoroughly known throughout the army that if any division, brigade or battalion wanted its telescopic sights tested, or if any individual sniper found himself shooting incorrectly, all that had to be done was apply to the First Army Sniping School. So this Padacani lot are very good at signage, especially considering it's a hunting area. Now I've got my photograph of the site here from 1915-1916 and here's a map we've come up this side here so that plane there is the wooded bit here. We must have walked over Pritchard's old Armstrong hut that he stole. Amateur archaeology is fun. I spend a happy hour trying to find out where the hut must have been from the photo in his book. I must be standing on the, where the foundations in the picture are just here but they'll be completely overgrown and uh, I think the German V1 program put paid to the Armstrong hut. Well he was in a very good position citing his sniping school here because over at that end of the view is Vimy Ridge which the Canadians famously fought and the first army 
forces and trenches, quite shallow trenches, stretched all the way to Arras over here. So he could look down on the battle raging right in front of him. And for every one British soldier he had up here, he had two Canadians. I think this is the point where the enormity, the crushing hopelessness of the First World War hits home. I'm at a training centre. Nobody gets killed here, but it feels like a fight has taken place. A fight that would go on to leafy Hertfordshire four years after the war with Pritchard's premature death that would create my granite-like great-grandmother, Pritchard's wife, whom I just remember from the 1970s, her children who seemed to live both in his shadow and bathed in his light. The First World War was not just about the people who died in France. An awful lot of people came up that road behind me. Pritchard writes in his book, I've often regretted I didn't keep a visitor's book at the First Army Sniping School, for certainly enormous numbers of visitors came to us. Outside the officers of the British Expeditionary Force, of whom several hundred visited the school, we had attaches and missions of various Allied neutral powers, Japanese, Romanian, Dutch, Spanish, American, Italian, Portuguese, Siamese and Polish officers, as well as large numbers of journalists. It's a funny thing, trampling over your ancestors, walking on where your great-grandparents have been. It's a bit like, a bit like waiting outside the headmaster's office. You know something big and bad has happened and you're here to you're here to feel that and there's more because this area has seen so much in the last hundred years it was Pritchard's sniping school it was a, an artillery area the Germans had their rockets here and now it's a beautiful woodland for Pritchard it will always have been his greatest work and it really is lovely to have seen it. Whoops. <laughs>